Hey everybody, good evening. Uh, welcome to Faith Family Community Church's Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, last week I had my son Maddox helping me and uh, Matt Nichols. This week I have my father-in-law, uh, Bernard Heath. Uh, we know him as Butch uh, or as Dad as, uh, or as Papaw. A lot of my family know him as Papaw. So, so good to have you here, Dad. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we're talking about a very special uh, topic tonight. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about um, how you can have a better marriage. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that anyway, some of the important aspects of marriage. And um, uh, Butch Heath is the president, the founder, the director of Crisis Family Care uh, Ministries, and that's uh, ministries to families. Uh, they do a lot of marriage counseling. Uh, all over the world, uh, marriage seminars, different teachings, and so on. And um, so we're going to be talking a bit about that. But before we jump into all of that, I want to just remind you that um, there's a, a lot of prayer requests uh, that are, have been brought up in the last just a couple weeks uh, in our church. And you can find that prayer request list if you go to the Facebook Live page, which many of you are already on there watching this right now. But if you go to the Facebook page, there should be a pin there uh, with uh, the prayer list uh, on the Facebook page. And I encourage you to go there, um, pray for those needs. Um, if you have a prayer request, I encourage you to share that in the thread below. Uh, and we will be praying for you. Um, we want to pray especially for Amanda Arvanides. Uh, her grandmother passed away this past week. So we pray for her and for the family. Uh, there's, there's others that have lost loved ones recently, and uh, there are some who have been sick uh, recently. We want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, but make sure you go to that prayer request list, and we will just uh, remember to keep each other in our prayers, to lift each other up to the Lord. And we're just going to open with a word of prayer right now. Uh, Dad, would you just uh, open us with a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, what a joy today to call on your name, especially to be with uh, Pastor Melvin, our, our favorite son-in-law, and thank you for this opportunity to share uh, on one of the greatest subjects that we can share, and that's marriage. First of all, you created it, and Lord, you want to make it better for each of us. So as we begin our, our session together this evening, may it be profitable, may it be encouraging, and may people be excited about doing a better job in their relationship, yes. especially those tonight that are sick and have other issues. Touch them as well. Bless our time together. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So um, I, I love how he always calls me his favorite son-in-law. I'm his only son-in-law, but um, that's all right. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, well, Dad, I... Um, met you guys a long time ago. Uh, Tamla and I have actually been married now for 15 years. And I knew you even before that. Um, I remember uh, we came back from the mission field when I was about 16. And I, I, I think we'd already kind of, my parents knew you guys, of course. Um, but I was just a kid, didn't really know you. I had uh, been around Tamla maybe when we were in fifth grade for like a half of, half of a year, school year, uh, semester. And she was like, you know, six foot tall, and I was like three foot tall, so it really wasn't going to work out for us back then, um, but somehow she stayed that height, and I grew a little bit, and uh, I remember when we came back um, from Ukraine, uh, we were at a big convention in Dayton, um, Ohio, and um, I was sitting up in the, the, not the, the, uh, uh, nosebleed seats uh, way up high in the scaffold and uh, not the scaffold what do you call those bleachers. Um, the bleachers thank you and we're sitting up in the bleachers and I'm sitting up there with my future brother-in-law Stephen Emery um, which is Hannah Emery's brother for those of you in the church who know Hannah and Stephen uh, it's her it's her oldest brother and Stephen and I are sitting there and uh, you know uh, he's dating my my sister so he's not really checking out the girls but I I'm looking you know as the girls are walking in and I look down and I, I see this one particular girl and I thought, man, I could, I could definitely, uh, you know, date that girl. I think, I think she could be on my list, you know? Well, it was Tamala. And uh, 
I think it was uh, two years maybe before we started actually officially dating. Uh, and I, I didn't really talk to, um, to, to you that much in those two years. You were my pastor, uh, one of the pastors on staff there at Hope Sound Bible Church. And I was in Tamla's grade at school and we went to class together. But uh, after we graduated, it was August 1st, I guess it would have been 2002. Um, I sat in your office. I went up, I went over to your office. I, we lived about a, maybe not even a mile from the, from the church. And I walked down there and I went up into your office and I remember sitting there and I said, Hey, I would like to date your daughter. And I kind of approached you that way. And all I remember is it was about an hour long conversation. And I said about five minutes worth, which is abnormal for me because yeah, I'm usually yeah, the talker. Yeah, yes. Um, he, <laughs> and I remember just sitting there, you know, you know, scared out of my mind, but um, I guess it's because it was a small office and I wasn't sure, you know, if I could escape if you came after me. So um, anyways, well, I don't know what your recollections of that day were, um, but if you have some, feel free to share them. Well, I'm sure we had a, a good interest in what was going to transpire with Tamala and, you know, being concerned about family and we were there actually as minister of family life. So yeah. my focus and energy was around family, dating, and all those kind of things that related and began the steps towards marriage. So I don't remember all that we said to you. I'm sure it was a very nice, kind, loving, generous conversation. Uh, at least you took and went after and, and agreed to date as I, I agreed to let you do so. But, uh, of course, we had a good marriage. My wife and I, we've been married for 60. Uh, we've been, we're 68. We've been married for 46 years. So your know, marriage has been something very important to us as well. And then, of course, our children, as they got older, who they would marry was very, very important. So, you know, we took some moments there, I'm sure, to be serious and to ask some questions, get some direction, to know where you were going, what your goals were, what your plans were, not that you couldn't change them. But I felt like we had a good meeting. I felt like you were very open to everything I had to say. And uh, I thought it turned out great. And here we are today. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I remember going home after that meeting with you and, uh, I was, I was so drained emotionally because it was a little nerve wracking for me to go in there and talk to you. Uh, and if you've ever met my father-in-law, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a big strapping guy. And so I, I went home, laid down on the couch and my wife said, or my mom said, uh, Hey, are, you know, are you going to call what happened? And I said, well, he said I could date her. And she's like, are you going to call Tamala? And I'm like, no, I'm going to lay here on the couch and just take a, you know, a little nap or something. I forget how I went. And she said, no, you call Tamla right now. She's probably wondering what happened and how, what her dad said. And so anyways, long story short, I, we ended up uh, going out to Baskin Robbins or whatever. And actually we were just there in Hope Sound not too long ago. And uh, we drove by that Baskin Robbins that we went on our first date. I was a Dunkin' Donuts Baskin Robbins. And, and we pointed and said to Maddox, hey, that's where we went on our first date. And so that was an interesting little little side bit from uh from Maddox's perspective but um anyways you mentioned you were the minister of family life at Hope Sound Bible Church and that's the college church really uh there at Hope Sound Bible College uh and uh it's, um I remember during your time there uh, I think you were there for maybe 13 years almost yes almost 13 years uh at least when I was there it was uh the and the family life ministry was booming and uh, we have a lot of good memories. I do of, of, you know, events that we'd had with all the different families, a lot of teenagers, a lot of kids involved in that. And so that was awesome. Um, but tell us a little bit about, uh, you mentioned a little bit about your personal journey, your, your marriage and so on. But um, you mentioned being minister of family life there at Hope Sound Bible Church, but um, add, add to that. And then, ask uh i'm asking the question what led to the founding of crisis family care and and where you're at right now in okay ministry? we were actually in talladega alabama for about five years prior going to hope sound and uh, the senior pastor at the time was paul pierpoint and uh, he wanted us to come and to work with the family ministries of the young adults they called them the yams the young adult ministries and uh, he wanted us to focus on that. So we felt led. We checked. I checked, of course, with God and my wife and our children. And we all felt like that's the thing that we should do, not realizing that that's where our children would meet their mates to marry. But that's, that's what happens. 
So we went there as Minister of Family Life, and our goal was to do just like use them in the church as a separate ministry, but a part of the ministry, but to focus on their needs. So we would have the Sunday school class. We'd have special times. We would do some, some seminars with speakers coming in, and we would have activities just focusing on fulfilling the whole picture of what a young couple should do, should be, and so forth. We did marriage counseling. We did pre-marriage counseling. And then while we were there for almost 13 years, we started doing marriage seminars at different places. We went to Russia. We went to, uh, I've been start naming all the countries we went to. And then from that, we realized, you know, maybe that's where we need to put our focus full time. So that's what we did. We left there the end of May of 2006 and began crisis family care full-time June 1, 2006. So we just started our 15th year this past June 1st, and I don't think we'll ever run out of work. Now, I may run out of my brain and can't talk or think anymore, but we're really, really busy. We're doing, uh, we do all kinds of counseling in our private office. We do marriage counseling on the phone. We do marriage counseling on Zoom. Matter of fact, I've been working for about a year with a couple in China who speak English. I've been working now for a few weeks with a couple near London, and uh, we have another associate that does the the writing uh, counseling for couples who we can't talk on the phone. So we have them coming and going, and God has just blessed us with so many opportunities. And it's just so amazing how, as a pastoral counselor, I tell them, you know, before we start, let me tell you, I'm a pastoral counselor. And I believe in the power of prayer. I can't help you unless God helps me. And I said, do you mind if we begin with prayer? I have not yet had one person say, no, don't pray for me. Just help my marriage. And I find that very interesting because they realize something's wrong or they wouldn't be contacting me. Yeah. We have a website where they go to fill out the form. They get an instant responder with my phone number. So I have their counseling need information. They call me. And so from there, we begin the process. And it can happen two or three visits, or it can go for over a year on a weekly basis. So that kind of, my heart's been in family from the day we got married back in uh, June, I know January the 11th, uh, 2007, no, 1974. Don't tell my wife I mixed up the dates there. But being married that long, it's like, you know, I've loved family. I love working with families and it's been our call and it still is even at my age of 68 i don't know when i'll retire mm. can't believe you're 68 that's crazy um i know i don't look it but that's <laughs> you look great um i you know uh some people hang it up at 65 and they're like well i'm just gonna retire but you know i i maybe it's because ministers you know uh they don't uh have the same income early on in their ministries right but uh, I think sometimes it's a, it's a financial thing, but I think most of the pastors I know that are still ministering uh, as they get past the age of retirement or whatever, um, it's because that their heart is in it, you know, and they, they, they're called to minister and to serve. And, uh, you know, I know that's, that's your heartbeat as well. I'm, I'm listening to talk. A lot of these people that you are ministering to, um, they wouldn't even be considered church people necessarily. Is that correct? Correct. Now, some have a background, some of them don't, and some of them are, if they did have a background, they've pulled away from it and are no longer attending church. Yeah. I know just about every church that I've been a part of, I know in Idaho, uh, in Virginia, um, Pennsylvania, and, and now here uh, back in Florida, uh, you've either come and done a marriage seminar or uh, done marriage counseling uh, with people from the churches that I've been at part of. So uh, I know, you know, every church I've been a part of has benefited from, from crisis family care. And uh, it's a huge, huge deal. There's a lot of people out there suffering in their marriages, uh, looking for guidance, uh, looking for encouragement, looking for uh, something to, you know, uh, rekindle whatever it was they thought they lost, maybe something, maybe they need something more than just a rekindling, right? They need Jesus. But um so what you're doing is was is is amazing, and uh, let me add excited. something there if I could. Yeah, that, that is, I find it also interesting that, like for instance, the other day I had two different appointments with couples in the state of California, Los Angeles, 
And it's so neat that we can go anywhere in the world. Yeah. We can talk to you right there in your house and in my office on the phone. And that's really great for some people. And then we don't charge for our services. Yeah. And the, the, you know, I, we appreciate donations. That's how we operate. But I always find it so grateful when uh, people say, thank you for doing that. Because we found many times the problem in a marriage is finance. They don't have money to go for counseling. Yeah. So we're blessed that we have the privilege of offering the services and not charge them. You know, that's, that's huge. And dad, you know, a couple of times I've said, Hey dad, you need to charge for your counseling just because, you know, I'm your son-in-law and I, I know that, you know, you, you're working really hard for this, uh, in this area. Um, but I agree with you. Um, I remember when, um, years ago, Tamla and I were going through some marital issues and, I left the ministry. Uh, I sat in your office and uh, during that time and you, you were counseling us, not as a, just as a father and, and father-in-law, but you were, you were counseling us. And then um, Ron Cook uh, and Care for Pastors, um, they did a, uh, we, we went there because we were a pastor family. We went to their um, Serenity House. They put us up for a week and we went to a, a week intensive. And we had looked around at different counseling places that were, you know, being recommended to us. And every one of them was so much money um, that we just couldn't afford it. We were, I was losing my job. We were leaving the ministry. Uh, I was trying to get set up. We were in the middle of a move, a transition, and we just didn't have the money. And so uh, one of the things that I, I agree, it's same thing with uh, Pastor Ron uh, up with Care for Pastors. Uh, they do charge, but they have a, they have a, ministry that comes alongside them and helps with scholarships and stuff like that. And we wouldn't have been able to go to, to Ron uh, without a scholarship. And so what you're doing is you're making it available to the, every, every, you know, uh, every local person, people in China, people in England, people all over the country in California, whatever. And uh, you know, so I would say this, if you're watching tonight and you think at the end of this, this is something worthwhile. I'd encourage you to give and donate towards, uh, you know, the, the ministry here. And uh, that's a little, little sidebar, um, but it's definitely worth supporting. Um, let's, let's shift gears a little bit, Dad. I want to shift gears, and I want to talk a little bit about the importance of a home uh, that reflects God and the Trinity, because we all understand the devil's attacking uh, the family, the biblical, you know, father, mother, children. Uh, model. And um, really, I believe that the devil's attacking it because um, the family was designed to reflect God. And just, just to give you guys some perspective here, um, you have God the Father. And obviously, it's, it's pretty easy to understand if you, if you look at God the Father in, a, in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, there's three units uh, within that tri triune Godhead. And then if you look at the family and you look at it as father, mother, children, there's also, there's that triune reflection, right? And we remember Jesus says, you know, the father, you know, I, I submit to the, the will of the father. There's the father. And in the, the Bible teaches us that women are to, uh, wives are submit to their husbands, right? So we see the same thing that Jesus says, I submit to the father, we see that wives are submitting to the, the father, uh, the husband. And then we see that Jesus says, then also I and the father are one. He says that in the New Testament. And we see in the, in the biblical family sense that uh, the, the two shall become one flesh, the husband and wife. So we're seeing there's a reflection here of how Jesus and the father interact and how also the husband and the wife should interact. And Jesus says, you know, uh, I the Father loves me, and I love the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's how the relationship between husband and wife should also work. I was listening to a really good um, uh, podcast this last week, The Holiness Hour, with Bill Urey uh, at Wesley Biblical Seminary. And he was talking about uh, mankind being made in the image of God. He, God didn't make them male. He didn't make them just female. He made them male and female, and the two together reflect the image of God. And we see that when the two become one flesh, 
then um, when they become one flesh, what proceeds out of that? Children. And Jesus said, I and my Father, we're going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. So uh, Jesus procures the Spirit from the Father for us. Uh, and so from the Father and from the Son, we receive the Holy Spirit. So it's just an interesting theological discussion about how the family unit in the biblical sense is really a reflection of the nature of God. It should be. And uh, it's so important that our homes do reflect the nature of God uh, in this. And that's one, one reason we mentioned the devil attacks the home because the family was designed to reflect God, to give God glory, to really, um, you know, shine his nature all over the world and just be a testament to who, who God is. So um, that's my little spiel on the theology of the family. Um, Dad, you want to just talk a little bit more about some things that you see that um, in our culture right now, the devil's attacking the family. So you want to just talk about that a little bit? Well, in relationship, God the Father, God the Son, you know, the Son came under the authority of the Father. And of course, that's why Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins. Yeah. And what I see lacking in many homes today is the lack of godly leadership by the husband, by the father. And you have two people, and both of them are wearing the same hat of leadership. And of course, that's a that certainly doesn't fit with today's the, uh, mm -hmm. theology or, or today's philosophy of life. But in the scriptures, the man is the head. And the wife is to be in subjection to her husband and to be submissive. And of course, I try to correct some of the thinking. That doesn't mean the man's the boss. And that doesn't mean the man doesn't take his wife's consideration in her feelings. And I think that when a husband understands the value of his companion and they talk, and then we could talk a lot about this, they talk about everything, but somebody's got to make the final decision. Somebody's got to give the leadership role to where they're going, what they're trying to accomplish, what rules are they following? What leadership role are they following after? And of course, it should be the scriptures. And so when a husband doesn't lead the home, and so often the wife comes in because there's a vacuum there. And I see what's happening. It's like they have equal positions, and that's not biblical. Yes, she has a very important position as a wife, but the husband is the head. The wife is the one, actually the scriptures say, she's the manager of the home. So the husband makes the decisions after including his wife in all of the discussion, all the decision-making process, and then he makes the final decision. So I see a weakness there in the home. As a matter of fact, the kids are running free. The wife runs free. The husband is just, they kind of meet together, sleep in that motel, eat together. Then they go out and do their thing. And that's reflecting on a society today that lacks great structure. And if you understand the whole issue of the home and the foundation of the home, it is the foundation of our society. And the reason why our society is falling apart is the homes are falling apart. That's the families right. are falling apart. Yeah. And what you said about the husband, you know, being the leader and, you know, the wife submitting, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, um, they're not equal in their, in their roles. Their roles are different. But the, right. the value is the same, and we 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 understand that right. um, that God created the male and female. The value to God is the same, but He created us for different purposes. I think that one of the big problems I see in our society, like you mentioned, is just that everyone wants to be the other. Everyone wants to do what the other uh, gender was made to do, right. and um, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, women can't be good leaders or whatever. It just means that the in especially in the home. Right. Uh, man, I, I tell my guys all the time, um, I'll, I'll meet a guy for, for breakfast or whatever. And they'll ask me, you know, this out or the other thing. And I, I tell them, listen, are you leading in your home? I ask them that. And what I found is a lot of times these guys are not spiritual leaders of their home. Uh, and, and they might be leading in other areas, but they're not leading in the spiritual areas. They're not leading in prayer. They're not reading the word with their families, they're not training their children, they're letting their wives deal with all the crazy and their husbands go to work and they come home and they don't deal with anything. Right. Um, they're not leading in their homes. And because of that, like you said, uh, the, the families are falling apart. Let me challenge you guys, step up to the plate 
and lead your families spiritually. Lead them spiritually. Uh, you be in the word. You spend time in prayer. Uh, you make sure that you're out the door in time to go to church, right? Um, don't let, leave it to your wife. Tamla, listen, I'm the pastor. I'm just going to do a little confession here. I'm the pastor, and I struggle sometimes with, hey, you know, the crazy of family life, and it's like, when do we get all of everybody together and sit down and pray? Well, uh, when do we get together and sit down and just read the word? Because have family devotion. I struggle with that. And, and Tamla, her biggest gripe with me in the 15 years of marriage, well, she has a lot of gripes, but her biggest one maybe, her biggest one maybe is this. I wish you would lead us more in prayer time, or I wish you'd lead us more in devotions, family devotions. That's her biggest desire as my wife, is that I would lead spiritually. And, um, you know, God's helping me with that. Uh, but I, I would say, guys, that if you really, if your wives are really honest, they want you to lead, especially in that spiritual sense. So, Can I add something to that, Pastor yeah, Melvin? Yeah, absolutely. Four, four quick things. That's the basic structure of the leader of the home, the, the man, the father, the husband, whatever you want to call him. The first one is he should be the priest of the home. Second, he should be the prophet. Then he should be the provider. Then he should be the protector. Let me just quickly touch on the priest should be the spiritual leader that he makes sure the prayer, the devotion, the study of scripture, the spiritual influence is there. He's the priest. And the prophet is the one that proclaims what is, what isn't the truth, what isn't going to happen, what comes into the home, what doesn't come in. He's the prophet. He's not always popular because the prophets don't always say what we want to hear. Then he's to be the provider that he brings home the bacon, and then he's to be the protector. And that doesn't mean just to lock the doors, but to keep out of the home what will harm the home, to keep in the home what will strengthen the home. Now, what most men think, I go out and I bring home the bacon, I've done my job. But too often we lose out on the other three key That's roles right. to being the father of the home. That's right. That's right. Well, um, I'm going to tell you that the devil is working overtime to destroy the homes, uh, the, the family. And um, I'm sure if you're watching tonight, you, you can uh, testify to that in your own family. Uh, I know, you know, the devil's trying to destroy my family. He's trying to destroy uh, your family. And I'm sure you can, uh, can sense that at different times. Um, there's all kinds of problems that we face. Uh, in our marriages and our families today. And I want to just talk a little bit about that, Dad, with um, just, let's just kind of give some examples from your experience maybe or whatever of, of some of the major problems facing marriages and families today. And, and if you're watching tonight, feel free um, to, you know, maybe throw in some of your thoughts on this as well in the text. I'd love to, you know, get some feedback from you guys on what you guys think some of the major problems facing marriages and families today are. So dad, uh, just jump in there. Many, many years ago when I was working on my graduate degree, I remember the professor saying there were top three problems in the, in a marriage and they are the physical, the financial and the in-laws. And over the years now I've been doing this for a long time that I have found it true. A lot of times the financial is at the top because for whatever reason, over expenditures, not making enough, then the physical issues, because a lot of times, and I don't have time to get into all those issues, but the financial and physical are two major problems. Not everybody has in-law problems, but I've noticed when there are in-law problems, they are real. Now, since I bring in those three things because they are real today, but since I've been doing crisis family care full-time for these many years, I've noticed through our website, to those who have responded in the confidential counseling form, that on top of those three issues is the area of communication. Hmm. Now that makes that has made great sense to me over the years because if you're not talking, you're not loving, you're not living, you're not learning, you're not allowing the relationship to grow and to become what it needs to be. And I have been shocked 
how many couples do not know how to communicate or they may know how to talk, but they haven't learned to listen. They have not yeah. learned not to interrupt. They've not learned the value of trying to understand, you know, or try to get a rebuttal before you even get the conversation started good. And so what I've noticed that if couples can work in the area of communication and learn to talk together respectfully, they then can work through some of the other issues that will prevent the breakups, the separations, the divorces, the remarriage and things of that nature. So I find those three, actually four things to be some major problems. Another one, if I could just mention this really yeah. quick, I have, I have, and it's often, talk with couples that say, are you married? They'll say yes or no, or they'll say, yes, we've been married for three years, but we've been together for six years. And I cannot tell you how many couples have started out together, living together without being married. And of course, there are people listening to me that would probably say, but you need to get up with the times. That's how we do it now. We move in, we shack up, we sleep together, live together, do all these to see if it works. And I remember years ago, probably when I was 15 years old, a guy was talking to me about that. And I was saying, no, that's where you trust God. You get the right person to marry. And God works through those other things with you. So I find that couples that live together, and I almost want to tell them, but I don't. I, I, I refrain from doing it. But they come to me with all these problems, and they've been living together, and they're not even married yet. I say, well, what do you expect? There is no commitment. Right. Marriage without commitment is just some kind of written down ag agreement or an arrangement that doesn't have any stickability to it at all. So I find those things are some major issues in our day that are corrupting the home, breaking up the home, and then, of course, breaking up more homes into divorce and remarriage. You've got to be committed in a marriage um, through thick and thin. You know, um, when we say our marriage vows at the altar, it's for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. It, it, there's, no, uh, there's no eject button, you know. Uh, if you have an eject button, you might as well, you know, expect you what do, what do you expect like you said right, right. so yeah i hear you man um and as a pastor you'd be amazed at how many people i i talk to on a on a week to month basis and you're dealing with it every day um but man there's just so many people who just think that's normal that's normal right. but that's not how the, the bible teaches it no so um you know a couple things that i i uh have experienced as a pastor that I've noticed are, are real big problems facing marriages and families today is there's so many uh, broken and blended homes. Uh, for instance, like you have, you know, a couple who uh, they are on their second marriage, their kids are maybe teenagers or middle school age. And, you know, uh, you might have she's got a couple of kids, you know, and they go back and forth between mom, you know, between her and their dad. And then he's got, you know, some kids over here and they go back and forth. And so you have this blended family and you're blending not only the, the husband and wife in a new marriage, but then you've got their children. And this is just a reality that these people, people are facing, right? right? So on top of in-law problems, on top of uh, other issues that you might have like finances or, or the physical, you've got all the other drama that comes with um, the brokenness and blendedness of their home, you know, and what I, what I, uh, you know, I don't know if you have anything, you know, a magic wand to, to <laughs> fix all that, you know, but my, my, uh, I just perceive that to be a real problem. And again, if we could get our young people to understand that marriage is for, for the long haul and make sure that they get, they marry um, people who are uh, on the same track with them, not just let them marry any Tom, Dick, or Harry, but, you know, making sure that as parents, guys, that you're steering your kids to people who love the Lord, uh, make sure they're around those kind of people um, and have those opportunities. And can I just say something? This is just a pet peeve of my parents. Listen, who your kids marry mm -hmm. is going to shape so much of their life and who they date ends up being who they marry. And I'm going to throw this out there. 
if they're 12, 13, 14, 15, even 16 years old, they're not ready to get married. So why are they dating? Right. Um, as your pastor, it kills me. It kills me to see all the kids that are just, you know, so frivolous early on. And they're, they're, you know, they got hormones, they got all, and it's like, well, it's normal. No, listen, dating is about marriage. Like, let them be friends with everybody, you know, but let, then when they're starting to get serious about finding that person who they're going to spend the rest of their life with, you know, that's when they should be starting to date. So just a little sidebar there. Let me, <laughs> let just, me add uh, something to that, Pastor yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is, when should you start talking to your children about who they should marry at what age as soon as you can as soon as you can you could even start before they come out of the womb start tapping patting the stomach and say you want to marry a godly person whether you're a guy or a gal but seriously as they start to grow older you want to drop little seed thoughts now here's the bold statement no couple should ever marry. I know there may be some some extenuating circumstances that prevent it, like overseas, but no, no couple should marry without two things. Number one is the approval of each parent. Secondly, without premarital counseling. If they don't have the approval of the parents, then something needs to pull back till they get it. And number two, don't walk the aisle to get married unless you've done pre- marital counseling yeah. because that lets you get to know the party you're going to marry in real life so to speak about how they respond to things how they feel about things and not wait till after you wake up on the honeymoon and say oh i didn't know you felt that way and i want to go hello <laughs> you would be and you know this because you do premarital counseling and, and i've done this too is you know when you give the questionnaire to them they fill it out it's amazing you know, these people are so googly eyed at each other. They think they know the other person so well. Right. And what happens is they start filling out this form and then you get it and you're sitting there as the counselor. I told Tamla the other day, I was getting to go into premarriage counseling. And I told her, I said, this is the best part about my job right here. <laughs> because <laughs> first of all, they're totally on cloud nine. They think marriage is going to be awesome, right? Uh, which it should be, should be great. It's going to have its ups and downs. Uh, but they, they're kind of totally died in the wool, like this is going to be great. And they start talking about, and my favorite question on the survey that I know, I know you give to people and I give it as well is how, what are your expect, like how many, how many hours a day are you going to spend with each other? That one, they never, ever get the same amount of time, you know, and the guy might be like, well, I'm, I, I think maybe two hours a day. And the girl's like, we're going to spend you know, eight hours a day, you know, walking hand in hand through life, you know, and it's like, we're going to have to reset some expectations here. But anyways, I love premarital marital counseling. I think it's a blast as a pastor because you get to laugh at people, you know, um, not in a bad way. It's just, it's fun. But uh, if, if they don't get their eyes opened up early, that's right. And they're in for a rude awakening when they, when they hit the ground uh, the day after the wedding. So all right. Um, well, uh, one other thing I wanted to just touch on real quick that I think is extremely destructive right now in, uh, in our world, in our, in our homes, is this, uh, this thing called pornography. It's become so accessible. Uh, you got your smartphone, you got your, the internet is so, uh, has just revolutionized everything and, and how accessible it is. Um, Sex trafficking, I was, I was uh, listening to Tamla and I were talking about something the other day and it came up about sex trafficking. It's like, I think a $98 billion um, industry, $98 billion industry. Um, and pornography has fed that, has fed it, has fed it, has fed it. And um, you know, I just think that it's becomes, it's such a destructive thing in a home. Um, not just between a marriage, you know, and, but uh, people be careful with your children and technology, just, you know, do your best to protect them and uh, keep them from being exposed to that kind of stuff. Cause that stuff is just not healthy. It's destructive in every way, shape and form. So um, just wanted to say that real quick. 
Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, the lack of godly leadership in the home. Husbands need to take the lead, but yeah, let's talk about something else here. Let's, let's highlight some the primary things. Maybe we've already touched on some of this. The primary things that, that lead to a healthy marriage. Maybe somebody's sitting here tonight uh, watching this, and they're like, okay, I just need you, I need you to give me the, the main things I need to be focusing on. Uh, highlight those primary things uh, that will lead to a healthy marriage, Dad. Well, I think the first one is, and it's not just – a statement is, but it's a practice of putting God first in your life, putting God first in your private life as the father, your private life as a, a mother, your to unite united life as parents, where you're praying together, you're praying for your children, but also you're obedient to God's word that it's not a matter of what I want to do. It's what is I'm, what can I do that will please God? And that includes your daily walk, your daily talk. It includes a church attendance. It, it includes, you know, where you go on vacation, how you invest your money, what you do with your free time. And there's got to be, God must be first. Another thing is practicing from the man's point of view, practicing loving his wife and the wife practicing respect for her husband. See, we'll never agree on everything. Matter of fact, you hear people getting divorced and saying, you know, we're just not compatible. And I, I want to tell the world, no, listen, nobody is compatible. Every couple enters into marriage and they're not compatible. That's right. part of the marriage job is working towards obtaining compatibility together. So it's important that you do that. And then let me just quickly give some things that are very, very practical along with that of things that you can do to help. And I, I know I'm going back to the great problem of communication and and also of encouragement to each other. Let me just share some things that a couple can do to maintain that healthy marriage. Number one, they need to practice loving each other with all of their heart. I know that's an understatement. Some are listening to it tonight and think, well, we I love her, she loves me. But love is not a statement. Love is a verb. The, the word love is an action word that brings with it certain things that we do to really right. love somebody. Yeah. Yes, we say it, and our wives love to hear us men express it, but it's also doing things for each other with all of our heart that they can see that we love them. So loving them becomes an active part of our daily life. A second thing is to practice letting things go. Practice letting things, I remember Gary Chapman talked years ago to a seminar my wife and I went to that his wife had a, a problem or tendency, I'll say, to leave the kitchen doors and drawers open. And it would irritate him. He would get on to his wife. One day he came home, walked into the kitchen, True to form, his wife had left the kitchen doors and the kitchen drawers open. He looked at his wife, I mean his, his watch, and proceeded to shut the doors and to shut the drawers. And it took him seconds. See, a lot of times the things that we that create conflict could be let go and not to be remembered against our companion. In other words, you don't have to gripe about everything. You don't have to say something about everything. You can learn to let some things go. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 makes it very clear. Brethren, actually verse 14 and 13 and 14, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's just not letting your companion, letting your things go, but making it a practice. Don't gripe, grumble, and complain. Look for things to love. Look for things to let go. Another thing is, and this is a hard one, practice giving up your rights and work together. See, we, even in marriage, and it really shows its ugly head in marriage, is where I want it my way. I want to go where I want to go. I want to do what I want to do. I want to buy what I want to buy. I want, you know, this is what I want. You see, when you are two people and you become one in marriage, we now are a team. We now are a unit. And there comes a time 
when we both must give up our rights, work together to enjoy a win-win situation. See, if you're at a table of discussion with your wife, our daughter, whoever, and one of you gets all that they want, that means one of them lose. Same way my marriage or any other marriage listening today. You learn to leave the table with both of you taking something from it, both of you winning, both of you understanding, we're going to work together. I'm going to give into this. She's going to give into that. Practice giving up your rights. Another big one is don't create expectations for your companion. Don't force them into doing things the way you think they should be done. Give your companion the individuality to do things like they think it should be done. Another one is be willing to make personal changes in your life. And the reason I would say that is because, as I well know, being married now for 46 years, that I'm not perfect. And I'm still working on giving up certain things, making some personal changes, letting, I'm still doing that, still learning that, letting some things go. By the way, it makes life a lot more peaceful too. Another one is, is to practice disagreeing agreeably. I mean, don't, why, why would you want to get into a, a loud fuss? Why would you want your children to see all the anxiety? Just, you don't have to agree, but you can disagree agreeably. And I got two more if I got time. Practice accepting your differences. You're not alike. I tell people, and when I talk about communication, when you get married, you are marrying a foreigner. Yeah. You're from different families, different backgrounds, different upbringing. So begin practicing accepting your difference. Don't try to, to mold your companion into what you are. You make the changes to allow yourself to be molded together with your companion. And then the last one is take time to pray together. Yeah. I don't know if there's a wife out there that would disagree with mm -hmm. the statement, I need my husband to pray with me, and it gives me a great sense of security. Yep. Men, we need to pray together with our wives. Take time to pray. There's power in prayer, and it's amazing what prayer does for all the other issues of our marriage, of our family, when we're praying together. That's just some real quick things. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, man, I, there's so many things that you could highlight really, you know, um, that would lead to a healthy marriage, but those are some of the, the best things we could be, be doing. Um, you know, I, I found that, uh, if you have two selfish people, it almost always ends badly. Mm -hmm. If you have one selfish person and one unselfish person, it can be a serve like the marriage can survive that it can be, but that the unselfish person usually is abused in some way, um, right, right. verbally, emotionally, physically, who knows how. Um, and, and, but if you have two unselfish people, two people who are willing to let go of their rights and, and come into the middle and, 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 you know, and meet the other person and, uh, have communication and, and right. serve instead of want to be served. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this. The one time I really wish, you know, Tamala would stand up for her rights is when I say to her, uh, we get in the car and I'm like, hey, dear, where would you like to go for dinner? You know, what I'm, where I know where I'm going with this, right? And she's always like, oh, honey, I don't care wherever you want to go. Well, she does, no wife means that, right? So um, there's, you believe there's it, you, you're missing it. <laughs> and so I'm like, fine, let's go to a Chinese food place. And she's, of course, she hates Chinese food, right? And I just do that to get her, get, get her, you know, get her going. Um, I love Chinese food. So, but I've learned, you know what? When I'm going out to dinner with my wife, we don't go to Chinese because she doesn't enjoy it, you know. And um, so we, we, uh, but anyways lost my train of thought there, but uh, if you're unselfish, if you're unselfish, you have a chance at a wonderful thing when it comes to marriage. Marriage can be a beautiful, wonderful thing that glorifies God, um, that brings um, him so much praise and honor in this world. Because I'm telling you, if you can, if you can have a healthy marriage and you can have a marriage where you learn to work together and you love each other. And when I say love, I'm not just talking about some emotion. 
I'm talking about where you are giving of yourself right, right. for the other person. You have the agape love that God gives us, that, that love that is self-sacrificing. Um, marriage can be something that really honors God and really is a testimony to the whole world around us. Um, so, um, you know, we have a couple of the things here that we could talk about. Um, I, I love in the notes here that you have prepared to live and plan life to grow old together. Mm -hmm. um, you have to prepare before you get married, but then plan just your whole life just to get grow old together. And Tamla and I talk about it all the time. I can't wait to be uh, married to a little old grandmother um, and take our kids out and spoil them or our grandkids out and spoil them, you know, get Maddox's kids or whatever. Um, so I, I really want to leave you with a couple thoughts here that there's hope. You know, if you, if you're willing to work on your marriage, God will help you to improve it. And maybe you want to touch on that dad, just for a second before we close. Well, I think hope. you have, to, you have to make it a daily event because if you're not careful, I know I'm finding myself Sunday night realizing I've got the week ahead of me before I know it's Friday. Yeah. And if you don't plan each day to have certain parts of it the way you want it to be in your time together, you're praying together, you're saving mm -hmm. together, your, your long-term you know, goals that you have in mind, they're not going to happen. You're going to wake up a year from now thinking, I've done nothing about it. So work towards at least planning something every day or talking about it, writing it down weekly and have some things in, in place because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, we have people that couples that are losing their companions they're getting caught up with cancer and we've got to be working daily that's right. in the preparation for tomorrow. Yeah, that's good. And there's no greater cheerleader for your marriage than God himself. I'll just put it that way. Uh, I really believe that if you're watching today and your marriage is, you know, in a tough spot, um, that's not how God wanted it to be. Uh, marriage is there. It's a, the first thing that God ordained in this world, the first institution that God ordained. He did it so uh, he said it's not good for man to be alone, you know. And when when he got made man, male and female, he said it is very good. Uh, I, I think – the, the one who wants to see your marriage work more than anybody is God. Uh, he knows what that means uh, for you. And uh, just uh, know that God is for you. And uh, if you're willing to sacrifice and you're willing to surrender, um, you know, your rights and, and work hard and, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe you need to rebuild some trust. Maybe you need to um, show your, your, uh, your wife or your husband that, you know, you care again. And maybe it's been a long time since you actually were unselfish. Uh, maybe it's been a long time since you gave them a soft, gentle word and you've given a lot of harsh words over the years and they've become calloused. You know, just all these different things. I just want to remind you that there's hope. And if, uh, if you allow God to work and, uh, you know, you do your part, uh, don't worry about your spouse. You worry about your part. And uh, God will gotta work in your marriage. I really believe that. So a couple things before we close. Dad, thank you so much for being a part of our time together tonight. Um, crisisfamilycare.com. Uh, you can go to his website uh, and you can get more information there. Uh, you can also um, reach out to uh, Crisis Family Care at the number 772-263-2457. You can call or text that number. Again, it's 772 two, six, three, two, four, five, seven. And, um, if you're, if you're in need of marriage counseling, you need some advice, uh, in that realm, I can't think of a better person to call or, or text, uh, reach out to. And, uh, if you're interested in supporting this ministry, um, I, I'm sure that no donation will be turned down. Right, Dan? Right, right. So, um, and this is a this is a ministry that's blessed my own personal life, and I know every church that I've been a part of, this has been a, a ministry that has impacted families in my churches. And so I appreciate that about the ministry, Dad, and um, just thank you for all you're doing. Um, for those of you who are still watching, if you want to just share, you know, prayer requests, don't forget about that in the text thread. We'll be praying for you this week. Uh, you can also reach out to me or Pastor Matthew, Pastor Clark. Um, and we'd love to talk to you if you, if you would like some, 
you know, just to talk about your marriage or you need some help or advice about something in those, uh, in that realm, we'd be happy to talk to you as well. Um, so, all right, we're just going to close with a word of prayer. Thank you, dad, for being a part of it again. And, uh, we'll just, uh, I'll see you soon. And, uh, we're coming down to Hope Sound in, in, in a couple of days and, um, I'll see the rest of you guys hopefully uh, this weekend. All right. God bless. Uh, Father, thank you so much for all that you've done. Pray, Lord, you'd be with us this week, that you'd uh, bless each person who's watching, be with each one of us in our own marriages. May my marriage be improved because of what we've learned today. We've talked about, help me to be um, more thoughtful, more caring, uh, more intentional. Help me to prepare uh, more uh, and spending time with my wife and, and, and engaging with my wife and having common goals and purposes. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you bless my marriage, bless our church, uh, bless the people in it and their marriages. And Lord, we'll just praise you. I pray, Lord, you bless also Christ's family care. And uh, Lord, you just uh, work through this ministry to impact uh, families all across the, the globe. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Talk to you later. 